Morning, church. Kids, you can head on up to Children's Church at this time with Miss Stephanie. And everyone else, you can flip in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. We're going to cover all the rest of chapter 3 this morning. We'll start in verse 6 and go all the way through uh, verse 13. Uh, before we get there, I'll give you just a real quick recap. Uh, there's a lot to cover in today's text, so I'm going to give you a quick recap. Last week we covered uh, somewhat uh, of like an emotionally charged passage. Remember how Paul is, is just in absolute anguish, not just over his being torn away from the Thessalonian church and kept away from the Thessalonian church, uh, but also uh, an anguish over the believers and the, the things that they're, that they're going through, the afflictions, the suffering, all of that. And Paul expressed a very deep level of concern over their spiritual well-being, his greatest concern was over their souls. And he said that when he and his team could bear it no longer, when they could no longer contain the, the concern and the anguish that they were dealing with and it was overflowing, they decided to send Timothy up to Thessalonica to establish them and to exhort them in the faith, is what the text says. Basically, Timothy's mission was to strengthen the church. That's what his goal was to be when he got to Thessalonica. And, and uh, um, really... The idea was to make them immovable. That was the whole goal. That's what the text tells us. When we look at chapter 3, verse 3, we saw that Timothy's job was to establish and exhort that no one be moved by these afflictions. That is what Christ's church is supposed to be, immovable. That's the point, and that's partially why Paul sent Timothy to Thessalonica at that time. Uh, the other reason was so that uh, Timothy could come back to Paul with some kind of report about what is going on with the Thessalonians, uh, how they're doing. He wanted to know about their spiritual well-being. And, and now we know that Timothy made it to, uh, to the Thessalonians, and we know that he encouraged them and strengthened them. And then in today's passage, we see that Timothy has indeed come back to Paul by this point and, and has given him a report of the church in Thessalonica. And, and that's what our text is about this morning. Um, it's really what Paul has to say about Timothy's report. He, he, it's, it's what Paul wrote to the Thessalonians about what Timothy had to say about the Thessalonians. And so if you go to chapter 3, verse 6, we'll read through 13 and then we'll begin to dig in. In just a second, if my clicker works. There we go. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you, for this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live, if you are standing fast in the Lord, for what thanksgiving can we return to God for you for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. All right, so this whole thing, I'm just going to say, reminds me a little bit of a mandate that we see in Scripture uh, for the church in regard to the church's leadership. And we've seen this kind of thing a few times throughout this, this letter, kind of the reverse of it, this, this implicit uh, demand for uh, pastoral affection in the church and uh, a model for, for good and strong leadership in the church and this concern uh, of a shepherd for the sheep, basically, and those things have really been riddled throughout First Thessalonians so far, and uh, Paul and his team have served as a wonderful example to what good leadership looks like in a church and what good uh, church and spiritual leaders ought to do. And today we kind of have the flip side of this whole thing. In relationship to their leaders, we see what the model church ought to be. Today, that's what we get to focus on. This is all. This all really fits really well with a, uh, with a verse that I brought up last week. Last week's text and this week's text kind of fit well with uh, Hebrews chapter thirteen verse seventeen, which says, uh, "Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls and those who as those who will have to give an account." And then today's text, 
really focuses on this next part. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. And so if I had to put a main idea to our text today, there are probably several different main ideas that we could put to it, but I, I see this in a very particular lens here. It would be how a church can bring joy to her leaders in the faith. Because ultimately that is what we see in this passage, a church that brings joy to their leaders in the faith. And I love what the author of Hebrews has to say about this whole thing. Uh, he, he says it would be of no advantage to the church if they were the type of church that inspired groaning in their leaders rather than joy in their leaders. And our passage this morning I think shows us at least in part what kind of church brings joy to their leaders. And this is not a, this is not a complete view of, of the topic. This is uh, just what we see in the text, what, these, what this church is doing to allow Paul and his companions to, to joyfully lead. And there are two things specific in the text that we see. There are two things in the text, a steadfast faith and a genuine love. These are the two things that are going to be, uh, that are going to be moving with us throughout this passage this morning. And we're going to take a closer look at verses 6 through 9 here, uh, which is where we first see the, the idea of, of faith and love in the passage. And then we're going to revisit faith and love in the second half of the passage. And I apologize, my, my clicker is malfunctioning an awful lot. So I've, Trevor, you just follow me. You got me. So here's what, what the text begins to say, but now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you, for this reason, brothers, in all of our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live, if you are standing fast in the Lord, for what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God. Now, it'd probably be a little bit helpful for me to start off in a very particular way here, seeing things through uh, Paul's timeline here. Last week in verses one through five, chapter three, verses one through five, uh, we saw that Paul was talking about a, a, a past concern or some past concerns, concerns that he had been feeling for the church. He'd been quite worried about the church, their suffering, their affliction, their persecution, all of these hardships, and you know the story, right? We, we just talked about it. He sent Timothy to them to fortify their faith. And then in verses 6 through 9, we see that, that Paul shifts from that past concern to a very present uh, thanksgiving and a present joy that he feels over, over the report that he has gotten back from Timothy, a joy that he feels currently in these believers. And we see in verse 6 that, that Timothy has, has returned from Thessalonica to Paul, and has given him a, a good report of the church. Timothy says, uh, or Paul says, Timothy has brought us uh, good news about your faith and love. And those two things, again, are the main concepts for this morning. Good news about your faith and love. And, and this report answered two of, I would say, two of the greatest concerns that Paul had. Uh, to the greatest two past concerns that Paul had in, in the previous passage. And we're going to start with the love side of things. And, and if you do your best to follow along with me this morning, uh, I'm, I'm not going to take the text in exactly the order that it is written, so, so do your best to follow along with me. Um, but we're first going to look at, at this love. Um, Timothy brought good news of the church's love. And the text says, Timothy brought us the good news of your love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. Now, I believe that this is uh, to be a response to, to one of those great concerns of Paul. I believe that Paul um, had this great concern that the love that he felt for this church, for the Thessalonian church, was not uh, reciprocated. Uh, he was likely worried that because of his absence, which, which remember was the work of the enemy, the enemy had orphaned him from, from these believers. So because of his absence and in the face of all of these people who were evidently attacking Paul, attacking his ministry, attacking his credibility, throwing accusations his way, the Thessalonians may have, may have bought into it and lost their affection for him. That's, that's what Paul's big concern was. And so when we plug this passage into the, into the greater context of this particular letter, when we see it in light of everything that's come before and what directly follows this passage, I think the context dictates that, that Paul is not 
referencing, when he says love, you know, talking about their love, he's not referencing a, a general love that these Christians have for each other or for other people, but specifically a, a love that they have for Paul and the leaders of the church, a reciprocation of the love that Paul feels for them. And, and remember, Paul, Paul has used some very, very strong language to describe his love and his longing to be with them. Like he, he's putting it all out there for these believers and, and, and has had this agonizing concern that the Thessalonians have moved on both from Paul and, and perhaps even from uh, the gospel that Paul brought to them. And Timothy's report communicates to Paul that no, that the Thessalonians, they feel the same way that you feel about them. They feel that way about you. They are still with you. He says, you always remember us kindly, and some translations will say that you have a good remembrance of us. There's a, a, a positive feelings when you think on us, and you long to see us as we long to see you. So what Paul is saying here is, is that he's finding joy in, in, in that the level of longing is mutual. The level of longing is mutual. It's equal. What, what they feel for Paul is how Paul feels for them. It's, it's this mutual thing. And there's probably this major sense of relief for Paul in, in how he was, in the feeling that this was mutual, that this great concern, this great weight lifted off of him. He was very concerned that they had abandoned their affection for him. And I'll tell you that it is always good. It is always good to find out that someone feels for you what you feel for them, right? That's always a good feeling. That's an awesome feeling. It's, it's likely, again, this huge weight lifted off of Paul's shoulders. Paul loves them, and he longs to be with this church, and this church loves Paul and longs to be with him too. That's the report that Paul got. And let me tell you, church, that is absolutely valuable. This does bring about joy in ministry, Connect back with the, with the context here. The enemy, again, has torn Paul away, has kept Paul away from the church. And in the wake of that, that, um, that absence, the enemy has worked on the inside of this, too, to discredit Paul, discredit his ministry, and, and uh, discredit the message that Paul had preached to them and drive a wedge between this church and their leaders, that's what, we, that's what we saw in last week's text, this wedge that's being driven in there. It's, it's an attack on the church by attacking the church's leader and driving that wedge in. The enemy wants this whole separation between Paul and the church, doesn't want to have anything, doesn't want the two of them to have anything to do with each other. He wants the church to think that Paul is just, you know, some other sleazeball who's come through like many others have and, and, and you know, was motivated by his own selfish pride or, or whatever, and, and that he has now left and has abandoned them and, and has moved on, isn't thinking about them anymore. And the very fact that this church has not abandoned their love for Paul in the midst of all of that tells us that they showed a very resilient trust for Paul and for Paul's team, and they fought back against these attacks. And I want you to think about that from a leadership standpoint for just a minute, and I, I would say that there's probably nobody no one here in this room who, who's immune to the attacks of other people. You know, we get, it, it happens all the time, right? We, we have been unfairly disparaged personally, collectively. Uh, usually the gossip train kind of gets to, gets to move in and people falsely assume, um, falsely assume poor motives on your part or, or uh, they just say things that are flat out not true of you or they mock you or belittle you uh, in front of other people. And that certainly does not feel good. That does not feel good. It, we, we can shrug it off. We can say we're going to move on, you know, no big deal. But it still doesn't feel good when people say or, or do things like that. And it especially hurts when these things are meant to or begin to drive a wedge between leaders and the people that these leaders serve. And one of the first things that comes to my mind when I'm told of something like that, when somebody comes back to me and says, oh, this person said, you know, such and such about you, I, I, you know, I can shrug it off, but then I wonder, okay, so how did you respond to that? How did you respond when they said those things about me? I mean, I have, I have a desire, and I, I would say I even have a responsibility that my own conduct would, would speak for itself, and that when someone talks junk, that it that would fall on, on deaf ears because people, people know me, they know my character, and they know that these things aren't true, but I also have this desire that those deaf ears, 
when, when those words come upon them, that they would inform their mouth to speak sometimes, right? And, and that they would inform their mouth to defend me. I, I want to know that my loved ones have my back. And, I, and I'm sure that you can relate to that in one way or another. And, and, and that's what Really, in the text, that's what Paul is finding out about the Thessalonian church. He, he's finding that the Thessalonian church has his back, that they aren't believing the harsh accusations about him. They aren't wavering in their bond with Paul. Paul is finding that these believers that he loves so much love him back, so much so that they are likely not shaken in the least bit uh, regarding Paul's character, regarding Paul's ministry, and they are likely, in fact, defending it, at the very least, by, uh, by their conduct in moving forward in a manner in which Paul has instructed them to move forward. And so this should communicate to us that this church should not just tepidly, tepidly receive Paul's ministry while he was there, but they also proactively fought for Paul and his ministry while he was away. Church leaders are called to love their people, but this is really only a joy to church leaders uh, and can only be sustainable to church leaders uh, if the people of the church willingly and proactively reciprocate that love for their leaders, for their pastors, for their overseers, for their teachers, for people who disciple them. Uh, the other thing that Paul bring, that, excuse me, that brings joy to Paul is Timothy's report about their faith. Trevor, if you go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Good news about the church's faith. Paul says that Timothy brought us good news about your faith, specifically their steadfastness in faith. And then we go down to verse 8. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. That is a strange statement. That is a little bit of a goofy statement. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. For now we live. Now this certainly is not meant to be taken literally. I would argue that this is not meant to be taken theologically either. It has nothing to do with physical life. It has nothing to do with eternal or spiritual life. Actually, it was very, very common. Uh, it was a common way of writing in the ancient Greek. This is how they wrote. It was common to speak in this type of language about separation from friends and uh, as well as a willingness for friends to live and to, to die together. For example, there's this ancient letter that was found, and when we, when we translate it, it says, I beg you to send for me, else I die because I do not see you daily. And it's, it's, it reminds me, I think it sounds a little bit like the language of a dramatic teenager sometimes, right? Like, oh, I could just die, right? That's, that's what it reminds me of, but evidently our, our teenager, I see you nudging some people out there, right? Evidently, our teenagers are, are channeling the ancient Greeks, or, or even maybe Paul here. It's poetic, it's dramatic, but it's poetic, and it, it's really a common way to express a very deep connection to someone. And so what Paul means here, since we should not take this literally, we should not take this spiritually, what this means, for now we live, can also be translated for now we actually live, which has everything to do with a quality of life, not with life itself. Paul is saying his quality of life has improved. Joy has been restored to his life. He can continue living joyfully, continue under a better quality of life, under one condition. We live under one condition that the church remains steadfast in faith. Our joy is brought back to us only because of your steadfast faith. Paul is saying we're now living joyfully because you're standing fast in the Lord. You're holding tightly to Him. You've not been broken down just as if you've not, uh, just if you've not uh, abandoned your love for me, Paul says. You've not abandoned the gospel message either. And as a pastor, I can tell you that one of the most encouraging things that church leaders experience is when a church perseveres in faith. Difficult circumstances arise. Bad stuff happens, right? We, we've, we've been through the ringer together. We'll probably be through the ringer one or two more times, right? But the enemy tries to divide, tries to distort, tries to destroy, tr tries to cause doubt. But when churches hold fast to the Lord and stand strong in their faith, that's something that will always make the hardships of ministry worth it. Always. It's difficult to explain how it feels. The only thing I could really think of is, is uh, you know, if you've ever been concerned for the health of a loved one and, and you've been concerned that they're just not going to make it and then you find out that they're going to be okay, right? There's, a, there's a, a relief that happens. 
Um, my family spent two weeks thinking that my dad was a goner when he had his heart attack uh, almost six years ago now. You know, we, were, we, we had seven different heart doctors who were working on him, and none of them thought that he was going to pull through. Uh, we were worried. Things were so bad that, that actually we, we wouldn't even leave the hospital. We were sleeping on the, on the waiting room floor because things were just minute by minute. You had no idea what was going to happen. You heard the, the PA system come on, and, and we're like paying attention. What room are they saying? You know, is that dad's room? You know, it was just... Uh, we had no idea if my dad was going to live. And, and actually, he, he was only allowed to have one visitor in his room at a time. All of us family, we were all there, but he was only allowed to have one visitor in his room when he was in critical care. And I remember I was sitting in the waiting room because mom was in the, in the room with him. I was sitting in the waiting room, and there's nothing else to do, so we're watching a Cubs game. And all of a sudden, there was this voice behind me. And this man said, Joel, your mother would like for you and your siblings to gather in your father's room now. And he said it just like that. And I turned around to see who it was, like who's talking to me. And it, I saw one of my dad's elders from his church. His name is Phil. We, we now refer to him as the Grim Reaper. Uh, but he's, he, he's got this very, <coughs> excuse me, he's got this very heavy look on his face and his tone is one in which, you know, he is it, just communicating sorrow to us. And as though my dad had just passed away. So I got out of my chair and I said, is everything okay? And he wouldn't tell me. He just said, you just need to get back there and be with your mother right now. I thought, oh, I think my dad just died, right? And so my brother, my sisters and I were walking down. It, it seemed like an eternal walk down this, this hallway to, uh, to dad's critical care room and, and fully expecting that when we get there, we're going to see that he has passed away. You know, we've all got the lump in our throats. Our stomachs are churning. Our our, 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 we're trying to control our breathing. Like it was just this really surreal moment that I will never, ever forget what I was feeling, just that, that mix of anxiety and concern and sorrow. And then we get back to the room, and I, I, we're almost to the room. I see my mom standing over my dad's bed, and she's laughing. And I'm thinking, well, that's inappropriate. Like that doesn't, that doesn't fit what I think is about to happen. And, and I look in, <coughs> I look in, and I see that my dad is wide awake. He's talking, which was... Um, uh, difficult for him. He had, if you would have seen him at the time, he had these tubes coming out of his neck. He had this tandem heart that was put on him. It was, it was crazy, uh, the machinery that they had him hooked up to. Uh, but I was really confused thinking, you know, what is this? I, I'm, I, you know, we thought you were a goner. And I remember looking at Phil in the doorway, just angry with the man, like context, man, you could have told us. You could have told us he was at least still alive. But once my disdain for Phil disappeared, I remember I remember feeling this, this utter relief uh, that my dad was all right, and then you know the news that um, that you know he may be transferred out of that room soon and into a, a less critical room, and perhaps on the road to recovery. Anyone in here who has ever felt anything remotely similar to that, that initial agonizing concern, and then the utter relief and joy that your loved one is okay, that's probably very similar to what Paul was feeling when Timothy gave him a report that their faith is intact. Our joy has been restored to us because you are alive and well. Your faith is intact. We don't have to, we don't have to be concerned over that anymore, was Paul's message. In fact, we go to verse 7, and you see that, that Paul says, even in the midst of his distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. That their labor, he says, indeed was not in vain, the church was steadfast in their faith, so Paul was comforted. And then we look at verse 9. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God? Paul is basically saying we, we are overjoyed that your souls are safe and secure in Jesus Christ and that you have held fast to him, especially in the wake of all of these spiritual attacks. And, and what a wonderful sentiment that was. They, they could not have possibly given enough thanks to God for the joy that they were feeling because of the believers in Thessalonica. And it's these two things, the steadfast faith of the church and the love that this church felt for their leaders that brought unbelievable joy to Paul and to his companions. It made the stresses and the difficulties of, of ministry completely worth it. Churches bring immense joy to their leaders by standing fast in the Lord and by uh, showing a genuine love for their leaders. And right and wrong, I, right or wrong, how about I put it that way, right or wrong, I can tell you that it's, it's far easier to lead well when those you lead 
are loving and are faithful. But this isn't the end of Paul's addressing the faith and love of, of these believers, and it's not the end of his describing his joy. He says it's, it's good. You know, you're, you're, you are bringing us much joy, but, but look at this. Go to verse 10, <coughs> excuse me, verse 9, and then we'll get uh, all the way through 13, but we're going to really pick up at 10. Paul says, for what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God, as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. That's a big part of this, right? Faith comes back in here, but he's talking about a lack of faith or, or what they are lacking in faith. I should say it that way. And then Paul continues, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and all his saints. Now, there is a, uh, there's a, a book from the 1980s. A couple of savvy businessmen wrote this, this book called In Search of Excellence. The book was uh, was geared toward entrepreneurs who sought to unlock the holy grail of owning and operating a successful business. And one of the key components, one of the key components of the book has to do with avoiding the idea that just because your business is doing well doesn't mean that it couldn't be doing better. And that, uh, th with that in mind, one of the authors, Tom Peters, penned probably, probably the most quotable line from the entire book. He says, if it ain't broke, fix it anyway. And I think that that is the approach that Paul is taking to the church here. Paul's approach is, if it ain't broke, fix it anyway. Fix it anyway. There, I think, seems to be a clear directive toward pursuing excellence of faith and excellence in love in the Thessalonian church. They aren't broken. They're not broken, but Paul still says there is, indeed, room for improvement here. You are, you are not complete, and this was not meant to be a criticism from Paul, but nonetheless it is the truth, and it is always going to be the truth for any and every believer on this side of eternity, right? None of us have arrived, none of us have, have a perfect faith, none of us have a perfect love, and we all need to remember that, I think, that, that we all have some work to do in these areas, and I think that Paul throws this into the letter um, endearingly, yet with the purpose of keeping them from any kind of personal, spiritual self-satisfaction. Now, personal spiritual self-satisfaction is a great enemy of the church. It's when we get a little bit too stuck on the word enough. Uh, enough is a good thing when we look at what we have in this world. You know, God has, has provided me with, with enough, but when we start looking at, at the spiritual side of things, enough can be, uh, can be a bad word. I'm loving enough. I do enough. I give enough. I, I'm here enough, or, or I have enough faith. The word enough implies that, that we don't need any more, and we don't want any more. Really, it's the language of complacency. And unfortunately, complacency is, uh, is the enemy of spiritual progress. Something I think that, that we should have in our heads is that when it comes to being loving and when it comes to our faith, uh, the, the two things that Paul is addressing in our text, there, there is no such thing as enough. There is no such thing as enough. We, we are commanded throughout Scripture to grow and abound and increase in both of these areas. And we see that even the most mature believers in Scripture are, are told that they need to grow in these areas or, or admit that they need to grow in these areas. Paul of, him, uh, of himself says, says, I have not yet arrived. The Apostle Paul still recognized his need to press on and grow in his faith. And really, it's not a suggestion. It is a command of Scripture that, that it, given the opportunity, we must grow in these ways. And I don't want you to misunderstand. You do not have to know anything more than Christ crucified in this life to be saved. You don't have to know more than that. The Bible says professing Christ and believing in his resurrection and, and, and you know, changing your mind about who Christ is and about your sin, that is what saves us. That saves us. If you do not know everything there is to know, that does not make you any less saved than any other believer. But I, I'll ask, what, what about being sanctified? What about looking more and more like Christ? Hebrews admonishes believers who stick to the milk of the gospel and never get to that solid food. He calls it the knowledge of righteousness. There's a knowledge of righteousness that we must move into. And I'm going to say that, that 
the believer, given the opportunity in life to grow in faith and to grow in love, had better be working toward that end. I'll, I'll phrase it this way. Why is bare minimum an acceptable attitude? That's the question. I, I ask myself that too. Why is bare minimum an acceptable attitude? Jesus Christ did not take on our sin at the cross. Jesus Christ did not offer us forgiveness at the cross. He did not grant us salvation at the cross so that we could have the attitude of good enough. When you consider it, Jesus gave everything, and, and do we really think it's appropriate to meet his everything with our bare minimum? That's, that's the question we must answer. I think he deserves more than that out of his people, and according to his word, I would say that he expects more than good enough from his people. Good enough, again, is, is the language of complacency. Christ wants his church to grow in these areas, and Paul communicates that desire. Paul's desire is for the Thessalonians to grow in faith. Paul wants the church to pursue excellence in this area, to pursue excellence in faith. Keep growing, keep conforming more and more to the image of Christ. Be excellent in your faith. That's what I think that's the main reason that he wants to get back to the Thessalonian believers. When we take a peek at verse 10 again, he says that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. He says, your faith is not yet complete. You've got a ways to go. You've got room for improvement. So Paul's communicating the need to, uh, of the pursuit of excellence in faith. And then going down to verse 11 through 13, we see that Paul is praying that Jesus himself would make them increase and abound in love for one another and for all. And so we see from there that Paul's desire is for the Thessalonians to abound in love. Abound, increase in love. And I mean, if you think about it, church, love is the mark of the disciple, right? Love is the mark of the disciple. If you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, it is to be evident by your love. They will know we're Christians by our love. And not just love for some, but love for all is what Paul says, love for all. That's what he says in our text. And that word all, I think, is meant to bring us to our knees because that's tough. And I'll even go so far as to say that is impossible when left to our own efforts apart from Christ's work in us. And I would say it'd probably be helpful to show that Paul does not leave the Thessalonians on their own to grow in faith and abound in love. In regard to faith, Paul says that he, he wants to be there with them so that he can supply what is lacking in their faith. And that implies that leaders, pastors and overseers, teachers and, 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 and those who disciple others are tasked with assisting believers in their growth. And we've already seen how that plays out somewhat in, in this letter so far. And hopefully you yourselves experience this you know, regularly at, at Grandview, instructing and encouraging and, and sound teaching. But the ministries that take place within any given church are, are, are to be divinely designed for the edification of Christ's church, for the building up of his church, that we would all grow in our faith. And so in pursuing excellence, <coughs> in pursuing excellence in your faith, or as Peter says in Second Peter, growing in, in the grace and knowledge of, of Jesus, I would encourage you to be in the word for yourselves, uh, but also to take any advantage and every advantage that you can uh, of every learning opportunity uh, that we offer in the church. Small groups, life groups, Sunday school, when it starts back up, uh, abide student ministries, when it starts back up, contenders, when it starts back up, be uh, regular attenders on Sunday mornings and be ready and, and willing to hopefully learn and grow through the hearing of the word. That's where our faith grows, is the learning of, of God's word. Vi visit with me, visit with Pastor Lance, visit with the overseers, put us to task if, if that's what it's going to take. As leaders, we want to supply what is lacking in your faith. And as far as increasing and abounding in love, we have our source, we have our, our source of growth in Jesus Christ. Notice that Paul says, may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all. Jesus has done and Jesus continues to do so much for his church. Not only has he selflessly given his life for his church and purchased our salvation, not only has he offered that salvation freely to us, not only does he intercede for us before the Father, not only has he lovingly provided a, a divine design for the leadership structure of the church in, in, in a way that would uh, allow the church to, to, to strive and stand strong against the enemy, not only has he uh, or does he sustain and hold together his church, but he continually sources out his love to his 
church, that we may love others increasingly and abundantly. And we really have no higher calling than that. He, he does not call us to love relatively well. Jesus calls us to love divinely well, to love as He loves. And so this must be divinely supplied, I would argue. Recognize your own lack and desperately go to the Lord in prayer and ask Him to provide. As one pastor wrote in his prayer that I read this week, whatever it takes, Lord, increase my capacity to love. And we're going to talk about that more in depth down the road. Uh, pursuing excellence in faith and love requires assistance, and Christ is good in His design for the leadership in the church and His source of love within the church to, to grant what we need to be growing in these areas. And now, church, this, this morning, we're not going to dig any further into what those things look like, what it looks like to grow in the faith, what it looks like to abound in love, because that is what the entire rest of the letter is about. That's what all, we're, we're halfway through this letter, and the rest of it is all pointing forward and showing us what that growth is. We're, we're finally to this turning point in the entire letter. So, so far in 1 Thessalonians, Paul's focus has been on past things, and we are finally to the point in the letter in which he turns his focus into, uh, onto future things. He's leaning forward and looking into the future, and all of that is set up by our passage this morning with these two concepts, love and faith. Everything that we see from the in the remainder of this letter is going to fall under love and faith, growing in faith and abounding in love. And I'll give you a little glimpse into, into uh, what that's going to look like in regard to growing in faith and love. In the rest of this letter, Paul is going to address holiness and sexual conduct, brotherly and sisterly love within the community of faith, the faith of both uh, deceased and living believers at the return of Christ. I think that's going to be a fun one. I'm looking forward to preaching that one. Um, the treatment of leaders in the church, the treatment of troubled congregational members, the building up of one another, and even understanding and, and, and testing prophecy, which again, I think should be an exciting one. But those are the topics that, that we get to look forward to as we continue the next couple of months in this letter, and all of them fall under Paul's address to grow in faith and increase and abound in love. So I'll leave you with a challenge this morning. Our challenge, um, first I'll say be a joy to your leaders by your love for them. As we see the Thessalonians brought joy to Paul as, uh, as they loved him dearly. Be a joy to your leaders as in your st by your steadfast love as we see the Thessalonians were a joy to Paul and his, and his team by their steadfast love and be a joy to your leaders by pursuing excellence in both love and faith. Seek, seek to grow. Seek to grow as the Lord provides. As scripture says, it is for your good. It is for our joy. And most of all, most importantly, it is for God's glory. Amen. Let's pray. Father, your, your word this morning is busting at the seams with great truths, and, and I know we didn't cover them all this morning, uh, but it's my prayer that what we focused on here today has been helpful for each believer in this room. Uh, Lord, steadfast faith and genuine love are, are necessary parts of the Christian life, and, and no matter how well off we think we may be in these areas, each one of us certainly has room to grow. So Father, keep our hearts from complacency. Do not let us be satisfied with offering you the bare minimum. And Father, prepare our hearts for the weeks to come as we continue through this letter to the Thessalonians and we come to a, a greater understanding of how we can grow in faith and abound in love. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.